separation is not the gospel. The separation is not the Great Commission. It's not the main work of the church, but it is a wall of protection that God in, intends to be risen, to be raised up, to protect us from spiritual dangers. It's protection. Don't tell me that separation from the world in a very practical way, way down how we live, is not a doctrinal issue. It is. Doctrine means teaching as a teaching of the Word of God. All right. It's such a blessing to be here and to see so many in the house of God tonight. On a Monday night, we realize that there are many things you could be doing. And uh, so we thank the Lord for that. The pastor said I could preach four hours tonight, so I hope you brought your midnight snack. <laughs> we thank the Lord for this church, and we have many friends in this church, and it's a blessing to come here. And the enemies I have here don't say anything to me, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> But we're preaching on a very serious subject, and the subject is biblical separation. And we're seeing today, as we started out in Sunday school, a great collapse of biblical separation among fundamental Baptists. I'm talking about a wholesale collapse all around us and all around the world today. We looked at that in Sunday school, started out that way. And uh, churches giving up separation that used to believe in it. And, uh, and, 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 and at the same time, as we saw last night, uh, in the evangelical world and the broader world out there, uh, uh, there is just this incredible explosion of, uh, of apostasy and wretched heresies that are the, the sweeping across these, these denominations and churches out there, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, uh, the Mennonites, you name it, the evangelicals that claim to believe something about the Bible at all and the explosion of apostasy, and I called it the treacherous waters that are out there today. And you can go out there and be enticed by those waters, and they seem so enticing. It seems like there's a lot more liberty out there and a lot of interesting things out there that you can pursue if you just uh, uh, let down the guard a little bit. And, and as we saw, I instead of having this wall around us, let's just have a picket fence. And, uh, and have a lot more liberty to, in our associations and things and it's enticing to a lot of people. And, uh, and yet those are very treacherous waters. And as we start out tonight, I want to first read our text, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and go back to that presentation with a conclusion to it that I added today. But 2 Timothy chapter 2 is our text beginning in verse 15 passage on separation. I believe it's a very fundamental passage, and it deals with all the major aspects of separation. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more in godliness, and their word will eat as doth the canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Aren't you glad that God's on the throne? You don't have to be a Calvinist to believe that. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's the evidence of salvation. And, uh, and, and, you're, and don't try to tell me that there's such a thing as biblical salvation without some kind of evidence. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and of some to, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, purge himself, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth 
and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. We're dealing with the devil in this world. He's the God of this world, a supernatural being who is uh, uh, behind the mystery of iniquity that works, has been working for 2,000 years, the devil's program to put the Antichrist on the throne of the world. And, uh, but God's in control of all of that. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And the Spirit of God is in control of all these events and, uh, and, and will not allow the devil's program to proceed any further than God wants it to proceed at any particular time until uh, 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 the Spirit of God comes and catches, uh, the Spirit of God catches the saints out of this world. Now I'm looking forward to that. But we see these two programs working hand in hand, and we see the end times apostasy that the New Testament makes a lot about. It's a major doctrine uh, of the Christian faith that there is an end time apostasy, an explosion of apostasy at the end of the age. And therefore, God's people in these particular times need to be aware that we're walking into dangerous times. We're living in dangerous times. We're not living in a safe place. And we need to be aware and we need to be on guard and we need, to be, uh, 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 we need to know the Bible and we need to be, protect ourselves and our families and our churches. We're living in very serious, dangerous times. The doctrine of end times apostasy teaches us that. Now, most churches don't preach that anymore or emphasize that. And as we saw last night, there are treacherous waters and many uh, independent Baptists now are being enticed by these so-called conservative evangelicals. Uh, uh, like Ed Stetzer, who's the head of uh, Lifeway Research Department, Southern Baptist Convention, John Piper, and uh, Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah, Al Mohler, and many think, well, well, what really do you have against them, other than maybe they're Calvinist or whatnot? Well, they're dangerous people, and they're dangerous for many reasons. They're dangerous because they're holding hands with some very, very dangerous people. And uh, very, very, very dangerous people. For example, Ed Stetzer. Now, Ed Stetzer preached at a Trinity Baptist uh, church there in, in uh, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, earlier this year or last year by video. He preached. I got the video. I watched it. Uh, the Southern Baptist there uh, uh, teaching church growth principles to this supposed independent Baptist church. And by the way, they ought to go ahead and join the Southern Baptist Convention because they already have the character of the Southern Baptist Convention there at Trinity. But Ed Stetzer was there preaching. And, uh, but what about Ed Stetzer? Well, he, he uh, is close buddies with the king, the prince of cultural liberalism, uh, 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 Mark Driscoll in Seattle. We saw about him. We saw how he has these uh, sh uh, champagne dance parties on New Year's Eve and uh, R-rated movies and discusses them with the men and the beer brewing lessons for the men and uh, the, operates this secular rock theater and, and, and indeed cultural liberalism. Well, that's wicked. That's contrary to the Bible. And uh, John Piper, the same thing. Here they are together with, with, the, with the Mark Driscoll, Ed Stetzer and John Piper. And here they are with Rick Warren, the, one of the most dangerous men in the world today, I believe. Rick Warren, Southern Baptist pastor out in California. And here are Ed Stetzer and, and uh, John Piper with him. Uh, a close fellowship there, no problem. But what about this Rick Warren? Well, he is indeed treacherous waters today. Rick Warren praises the Roman Catholic Universalists such as Mother Teresa and Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a Catholic priest and also a Buddhist at the same time. Uh, uh, how could you possibly recommend a man like that? Recommend that God read writings of men like that? We told about the, the Sumon kid who was a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher. Uh, a, a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher. Third generation, I believe, Baptist. Uh, uh, not a nominal Christian at all. She was voted, uh, I think 25 years ago, 20 years ago, she was voted uh, Miss, Miss uh, f uh, a Godly Feminine, uh, uh, femininity, not feminism, femininity in her church. She was just like a model of what a, a good Christian woman should be like, a mother and, and, and a wife. And if 20 years ago you had gone to Sue Monk Kid in that church and you would said, Sue, in 20 years you're going to worship yourself as a goddess, she would have said, you are absolutely out of your mind. You are, you, you're totally out of your mind. And if you would have told her, not only that, your daughter is going to worship herself as a goddess too because of your influence, she, said, she would have said, you are crazy. But that's exactly what happened. 
and she got uh, uh, discouraged in her Christian life, whatever. And uh, uh, instead of going to the Bible and going to godly people and, and, and getting the right kind of help, uh, when you're discouraged as a Christian, you're downhearted, you're backslidden, whatever, get some good help. Go to God, first of all. Go to some godly people to get some help. There's plenty of help available for us. God has given us everything we need. But don't go to some Catholic priest or, or like that. And, and she was recommended a book by a, one of the men we mentioned, I believe Richard Foster, who's promoting all this contemplative mysticism out there today. And she began to go to Catholic retreats and she began to re read the writings of these Catholic people like Thomas Merton and she ends up worshiping herself as a goddess. And you might be sitting here tonight and say, well, that'll never happen to me. Will it not? No telling what can happen to us if we're not a careful and obey God in these things. And not only us, but our children, and not only our children, but our grandchildren. Rick Warren praises Roman Catholic University as he believes that the churches should yoke together with unbelievers and pagans to build the kingdom of God. How in the world can we build the kingdom of God without, without Jesus Christ being here on the throne? It's ridiculous. And it's ridiculous to think we could do it together with lost people. He's a huge promoter of the Roman Catholic contemplative prayer. He awarded earlier this year the uh, Tony Blair with the Peace Prize. Uh, Tony Blair, Roman Catholic, New Age, globalist, syncretist, wants all the religions to come together for peace. Here's Rick Warren uh, with uh, Leonard Sweet. Leonard Sweet is a New Ager. Here's a couple quotes from Leonard Sweet's book. God is embodied in the very substance of creation. That's Hinduism, thank you. Humans and earth constitute together a cosmic body of Christ. It's ridiculous, it's Hinduism. And here's Rowan Wiersbe is, in, in, in fellowship with this man, producing materials to educate supposedly God's people. And uh, earlier this year, he promoted the Daniel plan, the health plan. And yoked together with that with three New Agers, Mamet Oz, David uh, uh, Amen, and Mark Hyman. They designed his program that he introduced to Saddleback Church this year. And these men promote Hindu, Buddhist, yoga, and occultic Reiki practice, which is a transference of spirits, really. What about Al Mulder? Well, he, he's a very conservative Southern Baptist, one of the most conservative of the Southern Baptists. And uh, he even has a little bit of teaching about dress standards. And for Southern Baptists, that is just unheard of. I mean, he's very conservative in many ways. But he's a, he's a, he is an earnest, 100% supporter of Billy Graham, has been since his youth till today. And those are dangerous waters. And so this, this is, these associations and, the, and the, the, the influence that can come from these different directions, just by letting the guard down a little bit. Oh, I don't want to go hold hands with modernists. I don't want to go preach with Catholics. I just want to mess around with these conservative evangelicals. Look at 2 Timothy tonight. Second Timothy tonight. We've looked in this passage at the foundation of separation, which is supernatural salvation. The more I go along, and as a church planter in one of the darkest parts of the world, the more I realize how fundamental salvation is. The people just have to be saved before anything else can happen right. That our church members have to be saved. That's why quick prayerism is so damnable. I'm not going to beat around that bush. I don't care if it closes every door in the independent Baptist movement to me. I'm not going to beat around the bush about the fact that we have to be very, 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 very careful and try to make sure that people are really saved. Because if they're not saved, then what do you got? You got a lost person trying to act like a Christian? It doesn't work. There's no conviction. There's no power. We've got to be so careful with our children, so careful with the kids, so careful with the young people, so careful with those that want to join the church. 
And they ought to want to join the church instead of me trying to drag them into the baptistry and trick them to get there or something. They ought to at least want to. The Ethiopian eunuch said, here is water, what doth hinder me from being baptized? He said, I want to be baptized. Philip didn't have to trick him into anything. We've got to be careful about salvation. It's fundamental. And then the knowledge of the Bible and all of that. The foundation of separation. We've got to lay the foundation so that we have uh, salvation and we have a love for the Bible and we're filling our lives with the Scripture. We're really Bible people. In my experience, the average independent Baptist church is not really a Bible-believing church. It's a Bible-ignorant church. It's a church that depends on the pastor. And, uh, and, and the serious Bible students are few and far between. And it should not be that way. In the first church, in the book of Acts, in the day of Pentecost, those that uh, gladly received the word, they, they, they received Christ and they continued in the doctrine. And they loved the doctrine and they loved the, the word of God. That's the kind of churches we need and they're very rare. If we don't have churches like that, solid, solid Bible churches where the people are saved and really, really love the Bible and growing and growing and getting strong in the Word of God and then have a testing mindset, their own testing mindset, not the pastor's, your own convictions, your own ability to test things. People write to me and they say, well, Brother Cloud, what about this and what about that? You need to be able to learn enough from the Bible so you can answer questions for yourself. I'm not opposed to helping people, but we need to, we need to be serious Bible students. And uh, the foundation, if we don't lay the foundation, we've got nothing. None of this other stuff will matter. We looked at the, but tonight we're going to look at the method of separation. How do we separate? And, it, and it's two integrated things, I believe, and we see that in the passage here. The, the method of separation it's two integrated, interconnected things that, are, that, that, that come together to practice separation, I believe, that will really protect us. What we want is the kind of separation that will protect us, not just separation in name. Well, I'm a separatist. But, but we, uh, not just in our church documents or not just in the past. What we need is a kind of biblical separation that will protect us. It's effective enough to protect us. And, it, and I believe it involves two things, and they're both necessary and interconnected. Number one, we must identify those who err and warn about them plainly. Identify those that err and warn about them plainly. And then secondly, separate from those that err. But the identification is necessary as, as the first part of this. We see that, I believe, in verse 17. Paul did not just say, stay away from people. He even named the name, uh, gave an example of someone that, that, he, uh, that, that P Timothy needed to stay away from. He plainly identified him and them and the error that they were guilty of uh, 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 right here in verses 16 and 17. But shun, profane, and vain babblings. But, but he didn't just stop there with the generality. See, Billy Graham preaches against false teachers and generalities. He does. I've heard him. Uh, I, and, and, and just about anybody will do that in generalities, which will never get you in any trouble at all. And people won't be offended because they don't know who you're talking about. And they'll sit in there and say, yeah, I need to stay away from them, whoever they are. I'll stay way away from them. But, but, but Paul didn't just stay there with this generalities for they will increase unto more in godliness. The, the fruit of it will be bad, the, the effect of it. And their word will eat as doth the canker of whom is. Of whom is Hominius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. He identified them. He warned about them very plainly. I believe what we need to do and what this is teaching us here. And Paul did that 10 times in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, 10 times he named the names of heretics and compromisers and worldlings. Demoth hath forsaken me, having left this present world. And by the way, these were very public writings. These were not just for Timothy. These were church planning epistles in the first uh, century for the churches. These were distributed in all the churches. These were men that were alive then. 
And I believe what this is teaching us is that we need to fly the flag of standing against compromise and heresy in no uncertain terms. The thing, this thing is, it needs to be out there and it needs to be plain for the people. And some people, pastors seem to be so worried about it that it would drive somebody away and, and surely it will. Identifying a false teachers plainly in this day and age will certainly offend some people and make them leave and say, I'm not going to that church. But what about those that stay? Aren't we supposed to protect them? It's been said that no position can be maintained without a campaign. And I don't want people in our church that won't receive the word of God. Not to stay, not to join. Come and visit all you want. But don't join and cause us a bunch of trouble. Don't want you. <laughs> and that's a fact. We want people that are saved and to, for membership. We're talking about membership. Saved and they love God and they love his word. Worn plainly. Education. We need education in our churches. We need education about these kind of things. In our churches, we need our people to be informed so that they're, they're, they're not... Uh, they know what's going on. They know who to stay away from uh, so they can walk into a bookstore uh, today and, and know uh, that there's some dangers here. And yet most independent Baptist pastors can't do that. They can't. There's no excuse why they can't, but they can't. I was in, a, in, a, in a, on this trip. I went into a Southern Baptist bookstore with a pastor an independent Baptist pastor who I love. And uh, we were walking around, and I was saying, this guy, this, this guy, this, this guy, this, this guy, that. And he said, Brother Cloud, I don't know any of those guys. Well, if you're ignorant, what in the world are you people going to be? Well, that's a fact, isn't it? The average church today is just not ready for what's coming at us. It's just not ready not properly educated about these things. Pastor recently said, well, you know, I don't know anything about Darlene Check or Pete Town and then all these different CCMers. Well, you can't keep up with all of it, but you ought to know something. And if you don't, there's information available. Problem is, we're just not interested so many times. I think the Lord for this church, this church is not like that. I would not be preaching here if it were. I wouldn't be invited. And uh, because I really let my flag fly about this stuff. And uh, people don't have me in by accident. <laughs> One Southern Baptist tried to have me in. I didn't know it was a Southern Baptist. And he had me in in 1998. And uh, he was wanting to change the church. He had me in. He thought I could do that. And uh, they fired him that night. It was just a one-day meeting. <laughs> They did. They fired him that night. Education. <laughs> now look here. We've gone two days already. No firings. <laughs> Unusual church. No, we need to be educated. We need to be educated. That, that's a protection. Biblically educated, educated about the issues. Husbands need to lead their families. Husbands need to know something. We need to be students. It's exciting to learn stuff. And not just about hockey. Hockey's stupid. You can, you can learn all about hockey and you don't know anything. Not worth knowing. I'm serious. You confiscated the rotten eggs at the door, right? I'm serious. Life's too short. To be ignorant, to keep yourself ignorant because you're not willing to study the things that are really important so you can help somebody and help yourself today. There's got to be a heart to learn. Even if the pastor wants the people to learn, there's got to be a heart to learn. The heart's got to be there. The reason I don't carry very many books to churches usually is because the people aren't interested usually. They're not interested. I usually carry five copies of the title these days to a church. A church that might have 100 people, 100 adults. 
Why? Nobody cares. They're not interested. And yet we're, we're faced with all of, these, all of the onslaught of these things, and yet we're just we're content to remain ignorant. How can you teach your kids if you don't know anything? How can we be preachers and really do what we need to do for the people as far as education if we don't know anything? Well, identifying those that are error and warn about them plainly, that is, that will, that, that, that's the first part of separation, but the other part is just separate. When we, when we know, when we're educated enough to know who is wrong, who is going against the Bible, who is, who, 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 who is, who is the heretic, who is the compromiser, then the thing to do is stay away from them. And those are the kinds of words that are used here, like verse 16, shun. Shun, profane and vain babbling. Shun means stay away from. We know what shun is. It's not a complicated word. And uh, just means stay away from. Kids talk about that. Well, the other kids, they shun me. It means they stay away from me. Just stay away from them. Stay away from them. In verse 21, it says, purge himself from these. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says, avoid them. Uh, Romans 16, 17, avoid them. 2 Timothy 3, 5, from such turn away. Just stay away from them. That, that separation, just stay away from them. Avoid their churches and their meetings. Promise keepers came along in the 90s, and, and many independent Baptists were swept into that. Well, come to me with the promise keepers. Uh, an informed, really Bible-believing Baptist should have said, well, who's coming? What are they about? And, well, you know, Chuck Swindoll, Chuck Colson, and, all, and these guys, and, and maybe Catholic priests, who knows? And uh, we'll all get together, the Lutherans, Presbyterians, everybody, and any informed, Bible-believing Baptist should have said, that's crazy, I'm not going there. Well they, well, they want to teach you how to be a better husband. Well, I don't need them to teach me that. I got a good church. I got the Bible. I'm not going there. Those people don't know what they're doing. But no, many independent Baptists went there, were influenced by it. I think it's one of the things that destroyed the Baptist Bible Fellowship. And, and it was definitely the, this, the great start of the great slide among them away from biblical separatism. And somebody said, well, come to me to this Bible study. One person wrote to me recently, a woman. Well, you know, I'm not really getting fed like I think I should in this church I'm in, and, uh, and maybe not. I know a lot of independent Baptist churches don't properly feed the people. And, and, but, but, uh, but she said, uh, this woman in the neighborhood, she's got this Bible study. And she's teaching us. And, uh, and, I said, and she said, well, should I go there? And I said, well, you know, who, who is she? What authority is she under? And what is she teaching? Very careful. These people are influential. They can influence you. You say, well, I know, what I, I know what I believe. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but the devil's more clever than you are. Right. Women's Bible study. Uh, 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 there are some pastors that even send their, their, their people to, to, to Saddleback Church and things like that today for training. Well, we don't believe in what they're doing, but they've got some good practical things for us. No, they don't. They've got nothing. And the package they've got is a package. And to think that we can go and, and draw from these men uh, and not be influenced by them is, uh, is, is, means that we don't really believe the Bible. Be not deceived. 1 Corinthians 15, 13, uh, 33, evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived. Separate. Void their books. Their internet sites, their television, radio broadcasts. This is how Calvinism is sweeping into independent Baptists. Books. Heard of a man recently that graduated from an independent Baptist college in Alabama, and he was going to mission field. He'd been called. I know this man. And he was, uh, all of a sudden, I heard that everything's changed. He's not going. He's changed his whole position. He's not in that church anymore. And, and he's reformed now and all this stuff. And the first thought that came to my mind is, what books has he been reading? The new evangelicalism. That's where it's coming from, these books and literature. And, uh, and websites, internet sites, and whatnot, bookstores are very dangerous places today. 
And uh, Christian radio, very dangerous thing today because of the nationally syndicated new evangelical compromises that are on there. And uh, most of them represent this, this uh, uh, philosophy of, uh, against separatism and this unbiblical philosophy almost to a man and a woman. They represent that almost to a man and a woman. Those nationally syndicated radio people uh, voices are uh, Christian rockers and cultural liberalists. Almost to a person they are. I preached similar to this in North Carolina in the first meeting, and one night a man came to me uh, late into the meeting, and I was kidding with him. I said, have, you, have I gotten you straightened out this week? And I, I knew him from past meetings, and he said, well, he said, I, Brother Cloud, I got up this morning, and I did not turn on the radio. And I said, well, who have you been listening to on the radio? I thought maybe it was Country Western or something. And, uh, and he said, well, no, all those guys you're talking about. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that man. Wise man. He said, I didn't know. Yeah, you can listen to these people. As we said, the essence of this new evangelicalism, this compromise, is not the heresies they continually preach, but it's all the truth that they neglect, and it's who they're associating with. That's the danger. And you can listen to them on the radio and say, that, that's good, that'll help me, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the danger is there. The danger of being bitten with the disease of compromise. Who has told us we can pick and choose and choose some major so-called things from the Bible and ignore the rest? Who's, who's given us such authority? Separate. Just separate. Stay away from them. Avoid their schools. Dallas Seminary. The, um, the associate pastor at Highland Park Baptist Church when I was a student there in the 70s, Dr. Faulkner sent his son to Trinity and his son is a raging new evangelical rock and roller today. Not raging, but he's, he's a new evangelical, 100% rock and roller. His church in Oklahoma City proves it. I visited there one time. It's just it's nothing. He's totally left his roots, totally left his background. Why? Evil communications corrupt good manners. Can't we believe that? Well, I can go and be educated by them. You sit at their feet for four years, and you will be influenced. Will be influenced. Homeschooling material. There's some dangers there. In fact, there's a lot of dangers there. The, uh, many, many of the most prominent homeschool material are reformed and, and, um, and Calvinistic like Vision Forum and uh, Reconstructionism. We're going to bring in the kingdom of God and all of this stuff. And it influences people. One man wrote to me recently. He said, I know you warn about vision for them, and yeah, I know there's some dangers there, but uh, I don't believe it's so bad, and I, I believe there's a lot of good there, and I believe the uh, good outweighs the bad. And not only that, I think we need to uh, build the kingdom of God in America. Well, duh, you've already been uh, brainwashed by them. Not going to hurt me. The Bible just says shun them, stay away from them. There is a soft separatism among independent Baptists which simply is ineffective. It's insufficient in warning. The preachers and the churches, they, just, they simply don't warn clearly enough and plainly enough. Uh, insufficient in education of the people. Insufficient in actual separation. We need to stay away from compromised independent Baptists today, not just evangelicals. Uh, wherever the shoe fits, uh, wherever the, the, the Word of God falls, we, we need to, to be very careful today. And so separation. People are funny. After one meeting years ago, uh, preaching something like this years ago in Texas, I was eating uh, supper with the pastor, and a woman called him, one of his members, and I was preaching, I guess, that night on, on that... Uh, that Pentecostal that went all goofy and immoral and stuff. What was his name? And with the prostitutes and things. Swaggart, Jimmy Swaggart. And I was preaching about that, I guess. And I'm always preaching against somebody. And, and she called up the pastor and she said, Pastor, I was really felt guilty tonight. I really felt bad tonight. I listened to Jimmy every, every day and, and, uh, and I just love his music. And pastor, she said, I'm going to stop listening to him. But can I listen to him one more time? That's what she said. People are funny. <laughs> stay away from them. That's the safe thing. Just stay away. The method of separation, but let's think about tonight the reason for separation. Why? So strict and so narrow. Why? God tells us, and there's three reasons. 
First of all, so as not to be corrupted by the error. We see here in verse 17 that their word will eat as doth a canker, a, a, a sore that grows, a, a cancer that, that grows and spreads. If it's not cut out, their word will eat as doth the canker. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. There is a leavening power to, to not only heresy, but to a spirit of compromise. Well, let's just be a little more tolerant. Let's just tone things down a little bit. And then where does that stop? It never stops. It's a slide. And it's a disease that's catching Anchor. We see this on every hand. Jack Van Impey, when I was a, new, a young Christian, 70s, Jack Van Impey was a fundamentalist and he had preached in the fundamentalist type places like uh, Highland Park and different places. And he but took a dramatic turn in the 1980s and renounced separatism. That's what he did. He renounced it. In his book, Heart Disease in the Body of Christ, he simply and boldly renounced it just like the new evangelicals in the 40s. And, uh, but, but, and he said in that time, God comes into the heart of Catholics and Lutherans and Baptists and Pentecostals, and with God in us, we can fellowship with one another. That's the ecumenical philosophy, rejection of separatism. By 1992, he was praising Pope John Paul II and advertising the Pope's uh, 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 speeches in one of his videos. How blind. How amazingly blind. A man that worships Mary, Pope John Paul II, on his robe he had totally yours in Latin written on his robe and in his autobiography which I read which was in my library he said I'm, I've totally dedicated myself to Mary. And yet John Paul II, Jack Van Impey said he's a, he's a great hero of the faith. Yeah, what faith? What blindness? What happened to the man? Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived, Jack Van Impey. James Robinson, when I was a young Christian, James Robinson was a, well, he was Southern Baptist, but he was a bold preacher. He was a bold preacher. He preached against liberalism. I used to love to preach, hear him preach. He was a preacher. He was a real preacher. And he preached against everything. He preached against smoking. Southern Baptists don't ever preach against smoking. They all smoke. I remember coming up to a church one time. This church had, had uh, in the South, and this church had uh, started supporting me, sight unseen. Somehow heard of us or something. And so I decided to visit them when I was there in that area. I drove up into the parking lot. Now, this wasn't Southern Baptist. This was Independent Baptist, but it was the South. And I drove up in the parking lot, and here's a group of men over there smoking. It reminded me, it brought back Southern Baptist flashbacks from my childhood. And I, and I looked there, and I went over there. Well, I'm the pastor, pastor and the deacon smoking out there. So. And I thought to myself, David, you're not here to, to, to bother these people. You are here as a missionary. That doesn't affect what you do in Nepal. You don't smoke in Nepal. You don't have to worry about that. Let these people do what they want to do. The pastor's in charge of that. Don't worry about it, David. I told myself that. I really did. Had a big talk with myself. I got going in my sermon. Something happened. I was giving my testimony about how I quit smoking. And I just kept on that. I kept on that a little while. And I knew I shouldn't do it. And I, and I didn't really even want to do it. And they dropped me. They probably dropped me before I got out of the parking lot. Hey, the Lord will take care of you. The Lord will take care of you if you, if you do right before him. Yeah, but James Robinson preached against smoking. And I used to love to hear him. Well, James Robinson had a crisis in his life, according to his autobiography, and he allowed his wife to talk him into uh, a charismatic laying hands on him. And, uh, and he did, and he claimed that demons were cast out of him. And uh, while everything was different, the main thing that was different, he said, I'm not going to preach against anything anymore. I'm just going to preach love and unity. Well, there's, see, there's spirits out there, and you connect with them, and you end up in the same place. And there are, the mystery of iniquity. And, uh, and, and he said, and so in 1987, the first conference I attended, ecumenical conference with press credentials in New Orleans, there were 40,000 people there, huge, 40 denominations. Half of the people were Roman Catholics. It was, it was amazing. 
to witness firsthand. But James Robinson was there, and I went to hear him. I wanted to hear him. There were 200 speakers, but I went and sat right there in front of James Robinson, took a picture of him. And one of the first things he said, the new James Robinson, was uh, he said, um, John Paul II is the greatest example of morality in the world today. What, you caught that disease? You caught that disease, James. Yeah, it's a disease. It's airborne. And it's carried by people. John Paul II is not an example of anything biblical. What are you talking about? You're a Baptist preacher, James. What are you talking about? Have you gone crazy? Really? I'm serious. A Bible believer has to look at it and think like that. Well, he did, he did. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. John O. Rice was a soft separatist. His writings helped me a lot as a young Christian. But he was very soft, he was very careless in his associations. He preached a lot in Southern Baptist. He knew, should have known better. Should have known better, but he didn't care. He had this, he had a philosophy we're gonna talk about Tomorrow night, probably, but he, but he was very soft. He was very soft. And I don't think it's any surprise tonight that all of his kids are new evangelical to the core. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. We saw, we, we, we showed joyful, the joyful woman published by his daughters. And it's new evangelical to the core. I'm not going to be a man follower. I'm not going to be a man follower. I can respect men. I can love men. I can honor men. I know how to honor pastors. I've had a pastor for 38 years I, I, as a missionary. I know how to honor pastors. I know how to give them the benefit of the doubt just as far as possible. They're the pastor. I'm not the pastor. And I love them and honor them. And the older I get, the more I respect a good pastor. And it's, hard. it's the hardest job in the world, I believe, and will be the most rewarded job by God in the world. It's so difficult. And unless you've ever tried to do it, you won't have the foggiest idea how difficult it is. I recently published, and people are so hard today about pastors, and I published a thing recently about pastors' troubles, and I had invited some pastors to write to me and tell me your troubles, and, and I published some of those. And, and uh, about the only feedback I got from that from readers was, uh, well, they ought to just buck it up, you know, that's their job, and all kind of stupid things like that. Where's your compassion? No, I, I, I believe in respecting. Pastors have authority that I don't have. And uh, they're going to give account for things that I'm not going to give account for and, and all of that, but I'm not going to be a man follower. God didn't call me to be a man follower today. He called me to follow Christ. To fo and the Word of God is the sole authority for faith and practice. I thought Baptists believed that. I used to think so. Now I know most don't. Because the sole authority for faith and practice to most independent Baptists is some man. Thank you, Brother Booth. It is. It's my experience. That's why you can have a church that seems to be so strong and just seems to be so solid and just seems to be so good and everybody comes and praises it to the high heavens and says, what a church, what a church. And then the pastor changes and another man comes and it, why? Why would that happen? I hope that won't happen here. I hope if this pastor leaves and some goofball comes that you'll throw him out on his ears. But usually that doesn't happen and, and then just everything caves in and the, some good people will leave. Some of the good people will leave. But that still usually leaves a pretty good sized church and able to pay the bills and they just go right down the slide of horrible compromise and who knows where. Why? Because we're men followers. Too often. Don't be corrupted by, by error, by, by being careless. It's better to be heir on the safe side of safety and all these things. But secondly, we need to separate in order not to cause others to stumble. 
In 1 Corinthians 8, verses 9 through 13, we see this. People are watching us. We're, they're influenced by us. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 9 through 13. So as, so as not to cause others to stumble. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, they see thee. We have liberty. What liberty do we have? Well, we have liberty to do anything that pleases the Lord and anything that's not contrary to the Scripture. The silence of the Bible is not a law. The silence is liberty. And that's the subject of Romans 14. And don't judge me by your conscience. You, you can judge, but only on the authority of the Word of God. And, and we have liberty in many things. Verse 10, if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. And when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend. So people are watching us. We have to think about that. We have to put that into the mix of, of things when we think about what we do. Billy Graham. Uh, we showed the picture of how, he's, uh, how he was standing there in Poland before that Roman Catholic uh, Mary shrine and, and standing there smiling and greeting the people as they came to worship Mary. What do these people think? People have always argued with me through the years. Well, Billy Graham is able to go into those Catholic churches and preach. Well, usually the gospel he preaches isn't enough for those Catholics to get saved because to preach the gospel properly in those contexts, you've got to preach against the false gospel clearly. And compared to two, he never does, does that. But more than that, his example, what, with him in Poland preaching in, in John Paul II's church and whatnot, what did those Catholics think when they saw Billy Graham in those churches? Well, they think, well, Billy, Billy believes like us. Billy loves us and accepts us as Christians. The influence. Oh, it's been, it's been terrible, that influence. Incalculable. I've been invited to preach. I was invited to preach in the Jehovah's Witness Church in Nepal. And uh, Jehovah's Witness. I don't know what would have happened had I tried it. But uh, I was invited to preach in a seven-day Adventist church. <laughs> and uh, no, no, I'm not going to preach in those places. Now, they're always welcome to come hear me preach. And they can get on the Internet and hear me preach. And they can get my books and hear me preach. And I'll meet with them for coffee anywhere they want to meet. And, they, and I'll tell them whatever they need to hear. I believe they need to hear. And there's ways that they can hear. But I'm not going there. I'm not going to Southern Baptist Church either. I don't want anybody to get any idea that I think they're okay. I don't think they're okay. And so I don't want the influence... I don't want to influence my kids wrong that way. To cause others to stumble. And then thirdly, the reason for separation is simply to obey God. To obey God. God has commanded this. We began this series by reading scripture after scripture after scripture on separation. Without trying to be exhaustive. So God is pleased with this. It's a divine commandment. It's never right to do wrong, to do right. That's crazy. But so many people try to do that. Pragmatism. Pragmatism. Women preach. They say, well, the men aren't doing it. Well, the men are doing it. But they say that. Well, the men aren't doing it. And so the women, they've got to do it, don't they? Deborah did. Well, Deborah lived in the Old Testament. And Deborah, as far as I know, there's not a specific commandment anywhere in the Old Testament that would have forbidden Deborah to do what she did. 
she wasn't contradicting any law of God. God called her. But we have such a law in the New Testament to, that a woman cannot teach nor usurp authority over the man. Women are so important to the work of God, so incredibly important to the churches, but there are restrictions in what she can do. And uh, women, well, just for pragmatism purposes, just uh, do things that they shouldn't be doing. Disobey God because, because it needs to be done. I thank the Lord for my wife. My wife probably could preach pretty good. And uh, she preaches to women. I've never actually listened to her much. I don't want to hear her preach. <laughs> I hear that sometimes. But uh, no, she's a godly woman. <laughs> She's a very godly woman. She's the most godly woman I've ever met in the whole world. But when she, uh, she was on deputation, she was a missionary before we were married. And she went on a little deputation and went over to Nepal to work in a uh, hospital there. And she was invited a couple times in churches to preach. Come on up here, sister, and preach. And, uh, and she could have probably done a better job than, than whoever was there. But that is not the issue. The issue is, does God allow her to do it or not? No, doesn't allow her to do it. And, and she never did. She wouldn't do that. And she went out to this little hospital in Nepal, and, and, uh, and it was, they had a little church started there, but very weak, uh, uh, people that couldn't read really, uh, and, and educated, illiterate people, and, and they wanted her to preach and teach to them, to teach to them. She knew a lot more than they do. Oh, uh, a, a, a thousand times more than they did from the Bible. She's Bible college educated, and uh, she could have. You know, there's nobody else, man. Who else is going to do it? I, I must do it. No, you must not do it. No, you, you can't disobey God and think we're pleasing him somehow. That, that, well, in this circumstance, no, in no circumstance. No circumstance. We need to obey God. We just simply need to obey God, and when we obey God, we won't be uh, ever be disappointed or be uh, 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 sad that we did that if we just obey God. Not very complicated. Really, the Christian life is not very complicated. The very fundamental important things are not that complicated. God has made it so simple that ordinary people can understand it because that's who he usually saves. That's ordinary people. Separation is very important. I am so concerned these days. I am very, very concerned. I did not know where to go to church when I was saved. And I found a little independent Baptist church. And it was home for me. And they discipled me. And they taught me how to separate from the world. And that was so necessary that I do that to find God's will and to be used of God. I had to know that in a church that was able, willing to teach me that and, and take a stand for things and be, be some fanatical about things in, in the sense of really caring. I thank God for that. I want that kind of church. I won't go to any other kind of church. If a church is not staunch, bold, strong, separatist, I'm not going there because that's a big part of Bible Christianity. I'm not going there. I thank God that those churches still exist. But will they in 15 years? Very concerned about this. I hope you are. Because the only way that churches are going to stand is not just if we have the right pastors, but we've got to have the right people. Some people that will take the Word of God seriously. God bless you people. Pastor, would you come?